Morning. Oh, good morning. Hi, how are you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I guess I was still thinking about this uh, uh, meetings for the uh, breast cancer thing, and I'm thinking about when to start uh, start up. I've been pretty busy the last couple of weeks, so. I'm well, to... ask uh, Tarek if you can get a hold of him, because he is now in Tehran, Iran. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I presume on his way to some, someplace else because that's not a place I'd want to stay. Yeah, <laughs> it might be better than it might be better than Afghanistan. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, uh, so he's on. I presume he's on the move. Okay. Yeah, and then see what where people are available. Uh, yeah, uh, Shruti wants to join us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Karan. Okay. And uh, oh, and uh, my Nick Depp. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah. there's enough to have a group. Also, uh, my Nick downloaded the. Uh, I found a free and what looks like very good CAD program, uh, which is oriented towards building machine parts. Okay. Like, yeah, okay. like a CAD, yeah. And uh, I think the first step, I, I know you guys are working on the, uh, 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 what do you call it, the noise the noise problem, but I yeah. uh, forgot the name of it off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, but the first step really has to be a CAD design for the instrument which then gives everybody the constraints within which the software should work. Okay. Okay. And it will also visualize the problem much better for everybody. If we, if we all agree on, if we agree on the visualization, I, I've made rough sketches of it, but uh, it, it needs a decent CAD, three-dimensional CAD program and uh, uh and so anyway, i started that with my nick uh he's downloaded it onto his computer the program unfortunately doesn't work on my computers but, oh max uh no it works on max but it doesn't work on my old max oh yeah <laughs> and yeah. i don't have a new mac <laughs> right yeah <laughs> okay so uh, so that's uh, so, but Meinick my, my was able to download it and he thinks he can get it running. Okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, I'd say the first step is the CAD and the second step is the, uh, the noise problem, the representing the noise, because then it'll be within the context of the, of, of the scanner design. And we actually have a very sophisticated design which I think is practical, but this is one reason to put it in the CAD to, uh, to see. Uh, it, it, I don't know if anybody has any real CAD experience but, or, or machine construction experience, but we have to make a design that can actually be built. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're not going to build it because that, that building it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> okay. Right. But... Uh, uh, I figure the total cost should not exceed that of a standard mammography unit, which is typically the the, the high end units are about two hundred seventy five thousand, which is modest compared, for example, to computer tomography, which starts typically at a million, or MRI, which is typically three million. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we're, we're not we're not designing an instrument that is uh, out of the range of uh, of current expectations. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'll keep these in mind. These things. Susan, can you hear? Hi. All right, close your window. Your face is totally black. <laughs> oh, well, you might see the rest of the room if you can oh. see me. <laughs> no, just a little bit. I only see your silhouette. Oh, okay, well, I'm still play playing whack-a-mole, or rather, whack-a-mice. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The problem is your camera doesn't have a high dynamic range. Yeah. 
I probably cheaped out and bought the cheap one. Yes. <laughs> has something to do with it. There we go. Any better? No. You have to close it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. There. It's, it's, uh, oh, it's light. Like, yeah, there we go. Only yeah. better by you both. Okay, that's better. We can see your yeah, face. Now. It's a little better. <laughs> a little better. <laughs> I, yeah, so. Okay. I can only stay for a while and I can't go to the slam meeting and oh. people are harvesting wheat today. Oh. And, <laughs> And I oh. like chewing my cupboards from the inside oh. out. Oh, okay, good, right. Yeah. Well, you good you got dry enough weather to harvest, huh? Mm -hmm. Yes, finally. Good. Except for the canola. <laughs> okay. Our canola has issues. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, Do you know what canola is, Bradley? Yeah, yeah, it's like uh, corn, corn oil or... Like, it's it's not it's an oil similar to corn oil, okay. uh, which was uh, and it's a genetically modified product of Canada. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> was rape called rapeseed originally? Oh, well, okay. used originally, <laughs> yes. <laughs> they but they had to make it so that the meal was usable. Oh, okay. and with agriculture, you have to use absolutely everything. You can't they had, have right. anything. They had, yeah, they had to change the name also to market it. Right, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, beautiful yellow flowers. I I paint them. I paint my painting here. Oh okay. yes. The, what the the blue the blue fields are what flax? Yes. I haven't seen any this year. I've only seen yellow. Oh, there's a few. This is all a field. There you go. Okay, there you go. Uh, yeah. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, typical prairie rain. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. My oil, oil painting in the canola field. Anyway, at, at, at its best in the summer, Manitoba is covered with blue and yellow fields. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Especially when they're next together. It's, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, Yes, very pretty farms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh, plus, plus cattle. We have lots of cattle. Oh, right, right. <laughs> Especially north where you are, Dick. Yeah. It's, uh, there's a lot of cattle there. It, it, there's been an increase in horses this year. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't know what people are doing with them. Lots of doing rodeos. But. <laughs> oh. They yeah. do protect the cattle. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, Krishna okay. and Jesse. Hi, guys. Uh, what are you? Uh, how are you doing, all right, Krishna? Yeah. So, after Jisok has ended, I've been doing something, learning new things. Okay. Yeah, so I have started learning. I've gotten into ML, like learning more about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, I'm uh, learning about deep learning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it's something, yeah, it's always good to learn about because it's, you know, pretty, pretty yeah, relevant. So. Yeah. And also, I think learning this can help to improve the this uh, project further. Yeah, yeah, and there's always there are always new techniques coming up. It's not just yeah. <laughs> something you can master once. Uh, yeah, well, that's good. Yeah, and, and uh, you got my I did the evaluations for GSOC. So yeah, yeah. Also, uh, do we get a certificate after that? Okay. Yeah. Oh, you get a certificate like for the program? Uh, I read, I got an email regarding that uh, we will get one, but I can't see it in the project stamp. It's certain that uh, the certificate will be visible in the dashboard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. They had some issues with the dashboard uh, when I was going in to do the evaluations. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe there may be a bug in there too. So if you don't see it, yeah, let someone know. I don't know. 
Um, yeah, while well ask others who have participated. Yeah, because it was yeah, I was doing some weird stuff when I was in there, <laughs> and uh, they they kept emailing ever everyone kept emailing everyone else about it, and it was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, that's good. Yeah, keep up the keep up the curiosity on that front. It'd be interesting to see. Yeah. yeah. Jesse's here. He said he can't speak, but he's checking in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else? Anyone want to talk about or bring up? Okay. You're on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to point out that we're, I'm, we're moving to the next step after the projects. So the summer we did the uh, digital microspheres and we did the Devo graph. And the Devo graph is now up on the Devo Learn uh, site. So here it is. So this is the Devo, the Devo Learn uh, GitHub repository, and uh, this is where we keep the Devo Learn software here. So this is the the software that was developed in like 2019 to 2021, um, and then we have Evo Learn as the repository for that main software. Then we have the data science demos which actually Alan made a push to a couple weeks ago. So there are a number of data science demos in here. And if you're interested in doing a demo of something, uh, you know, you can uh, upload something to this space. And, uh, you know, we have a, a number of different things like GANs, networks, uh, other tutorials, Centroid extraction. So there are a lot of different tutorials that people have prepared. Uh, DC GAN. I mean, this is a little bit, I don't know why this is out here, but oh, this is, yeah, Minox tutorial. So there are a bunch of different tutorials. So if there's something that you learn about and you want to master by preparing a tutorial for someone else, you know, you can push it to here and you can share it with the rest of our community. And, you know, because I think it gives people a nice way to learn some of these topics um you know it's from from their peers so that would be nice and then uh we have data science demos and then of course we have the devo uh, graph which is here and i haven't pinned it yet um but i'll pin it in a bit let me see if i can pin it oh well, yeah um, but this is the repo, and this was just cloned from what um, Jia Hong had, and he was working from a repo in his uh, GitHub repository. And then he's got, you know, we've got all these different things here. So I guess you start with the README, uh, and this just tells us who's been participating and the different contributions so far. And I think this is something you have to download and run on your machine and then it'll, um, it, it's based on an original uh, approach to segmenting cells and then building these graph embeddings. And so this should give us some, I, I you know, I mean, it gives us a starting point anyways. Uh, we were going to submit to a conference, but we didn't, Jia Hung didn't think that we were ready for it yet in terms of the the work. I asked him if he wanted to go for it, and he said no. But that's okay. I mean, it's probably pretty competitive, so I didn't want to force it on him, uh, <laughs> you know, because it's a commitment to get the paper ready and everything. So, But we're going to be working on that over the fall, probably refining that a little bit and getting it uh, squared away. I haven't figured out how to present the uh, digital microsphere stuff yet. I might actually incorporate that into the Devo, uh, Devo Learn organization, or I might do it a different way. I haven't decided yet. But anyways, that's what we have. That's we're following up from on the, uh, on the different projects that we're doing this summer. Um, 
I also have some information about a conference this week, and Jesse is involved in the, with this as well as me. This is the Neuromatch Conference. So this is the uh, this happens every so often. This started during the shutdown in 2020 when all the conferences were shut down and they wanted to have a conference for people to present their work. And this is, uh, you know, for the computational neuroscience community, but they're always looking for submissions that combine uh, like computational neuroscience or machine learning or deep learning or some sort of something like that with biology. So they say uh, computational neuroscience broadly construed, its scope includes machine learning work that has an explicit biological link. And so uh, I actually presented on the diatoms one year uh, on behalf of the group, uh, was it Neuromatch 3, I believe, which was, I think, uh, at least a year ago. It could have been two years ago now. But, uh, you know, this is Neuromatch 5 coming up this week. So this is uh, September 2022. This is Neuromatch 5. Uh, let's see. If I go to the agenda, the agenda is, it's it's an interesting conference because it's all sort of asynchronous. What they do is they have, the, they have a, a main agenda here with different sessions. And the different sessions are hosted by people. So you have, you know, people invited speakers, you have panels, you have keynotes. And the keynote and everything is recorded on Crowdcast, which is a platform that uh, Crowdcast.io, which is a platform that live streams video and then saves it. It's kind of like any live stream that you might do. You can do this on YouTube, but it, you know, it. The thing about Crowdcast, and you have to pay for Crowdcast, but the thing is, you can host like a, a live stream where people can come in and and uh, give comments during the live stream and then it manages that pretty well and then it automatically saves it as an archived video so all this will be archived but it'll be going on in real time and so they have a session for like uh, europeans and people in asia it starts at 2 a.m my time which is north america central time uh and then that goes through to about 6 a.m so that's obviously i'm not going to catch that live, uh, but other people will. And then they'll start up again at 10 a.m. my time, going to 1.30 p.m. So that's for North America. You know, that's pretty friendly for North America. So, um, yeah, that's, and then it goes on for two days. And they have these diff, they, these panels, these invited keynotes and things like that. Then they have the... Uh, they have these uh, flash talks. And this is where we have actually, my other group that I work with has four submissions here. So we have a bunch of different flash talks that we're doing. I know Jesse has uh, one that he took the lead on and then he's on a couple others. Um, so this is, you know, where you, these are actually totally asynchronous. You click on it, abstract, you go to, uh, they usually have a video or a, they have pre a link for a preprint or a publication. So you can actually catch up on this asynchronously. You just go to the abstract browser, you click on something, you look, you go to the link and you can um, get access to the, to the video and maybe some other materials. So that's a nice model for conf virtual conferences. They've been working on it for a couple of sessions now. So there's an iterative design process where they, I think they started out doing Zoom rooms and then getting like what they call Zoom bombed, which was where people take the link and sneak in and do bad things. But I think that's, they figured out a way to, you know, really make this optimal, optimize this conference experience. So that's going on this week. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's uh, that's all I wanted to mention in terms of like announcements. Um, there are also some other C. elegans papers that have come out recently. Uh, I, I think I talked about a couple last week. Uh, one was reproduction, and the other one was uh, I can't remember what it was. Um, I don't think it was a connectome paper, but uh, this one, this couple of papers that I'm going to talk about now are actually neuromodeling papers in C. elegans. So 
The first one is about synaptic organization. And uh, this is actually, I don't think it's explicitly modeling. I think it's more biology, but it's relevant to modeling. Um, this is about synaptic organization. This is a bioarchive preprint that came out earlier this year. Uh, this is synaptic organization, the C. elegans neural network, which is, of course, the C. elegans connectome. So you have about, you have 302 cells in the C. elegans connectome, and they're connected in different ways. They're connected either through gap junctions, which is the most common way to represent the connectome, uh, gap junctions being these electrical junctions between cells, and there's a fat, what they call a fast signal there. And that's how cells communicate, and, and not just neurons, but all cells have gap junctions. And in, in neurons, at least, they have these fast connections, which are just like passing information through the gap junctions. Um, but they, you will, of course, also have synaptic connections. So, you know, neurons don't always abut one another. They don't always sit next to one another. Sometimes they're far apart. And so they get connected by extending their axons out and then extending out some synapses and then making synaptic connections. And those synaptic connections can vary in larval development and in adulthood, depending on what's going on in the environment. So sometimes in, in uh, larval development, you know, if there's a scarcity of resources, uh, the worm can, you know, uh, shut down certain connections or can emphasize certain connections for certain behaviors. So there's a lot of there's a lot of plasticity in the synaptic uh, organization of C. elegans. It's much more plastic than say some of the cell differentiation processes. So uh, and it's much more flexible than the gap junction based connectome. So there's been some work on uh, synaptic connections and development. Uh, there's at least one paper on that now, and this is a paper on synaptic organization in this neural network. It suggests significant local compartmentalized computations. So what does that mean? Uh, so neurons, of course, are characterized by tree-like dendritic structures, which are the, the cell body, and then these dendrites that come out. The synapses uh, are the connections between those, those dendritic branches and um, another uh, neuron's branching, uh, you know, so it's like those dendritic branches branch out from the cell body and reach out to other cells and their like processes and they join together. And this is this enables chemical uh, communication. So there's there are a lot of uh, neurochemicals that get passed through these synapses. So they're very uh, diverse in terms of what they're enabling in terms of signaling. So, um, uh, so neurons are characterized by these dendritic structures that support local computations by integrating multiple inputs from upstream presynaptic neurons. So you have a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron. It is less clear if simple neurons consisting of a few or even a single neurite, which is the neurite is the, um, like the cell body, um, may perform local computations as well. So these are simple neurons uh, as opposed to, you know, you have neurons that are very diverse in terms of their signaling, in terms of their uh, uh, neurotransmitters that they have and some that aren't. So it, it, it's really variable by the, in terms of the actual neuron that you're talking about. So uh, they want to know about local computations. Uh, to address this question, we focused on the compact neural network of C. elegans which is, of course, 302 cells. It's always 302 cells. Uh, there's some minor differences in uh, larval development, but, you know, those are, we know what those cells are and their connections. Um, to address this question, we focused on the compact neural network of C. elegans animals, for which the full wiring diagram is available, including the coordinates of individual synapses. So we actually know that, like, where the synapses are in like if we take an image of a C. elegans, we can observe the synapses as well as the cells. So a lot of microscopy, you can identify synapses in the in the microscopy data. You can see them. They look like little, um, you know, like little horns, I guess, that come out of the 
processes. So you can you can definitely see where the synapses are. We find that the positions of the chemical synapses along the neurites are not randomly distributed, nor can they be explained by anatomical constraints. Instead, synapses tend to form clusters, an organization that supports local compartmentalized computations. So these, uh, if you look at the neurites of a cell, you have a cell body, you have the neurites, you have these chemical synapses. They're not randomly distributed. They're not like re uh, regularly distributed. They're not even distributed by these anatomical constraints. Uh, they form clusters in certain areas. And then this supports these localized compartmentalized computations. So, you know, you might have uh, synapses in a certain area where you want to perform a computation. Um, and so that's that's what they're finding here. I, they, I'm, I, I'm assuming there's some images, so we might go down later and look at those. In mutually synapsing neurons, connections of opposite polarity cluster separately. So these uh, connections of different polarities cluster in different clusters, um, suggesting that positive and negative feedback dynamics may be implemented in discrete compartmentalized regions along neurites. So when you have two neurons that are synapsing on one another, so you have neuron A and neuron B, and I can do this on my uh, board here. So if you have A and you have B, and they synapse, A synapses to B, B synapses back to A. These uh, synapses are clustered along the processes. So actually each cell will have a bunch of processes coming out like this. And this will be just, you know, this is the presynaptic neuron for this postsynaptic neuron, but it also serves as the presynaptic neuron to B, which is a postsynaptic relationship. So you, you have this reciprocal connectivity, you have these branching structures, and then these two, uh, these are of different polarities. But these synapses are all grouped here in a cluster. And so spatially, they, they exist as a cluster. And so that's what they're, that's what they're talking about, that kind of relationship. So these are mutually synapsing neurons in the first case. And then in the second, they, oh, sorry, um, do they know what uh, charge density there is with the uh, um, within these clusters? I yeah, I don't know. We'll have to look in the methods maybe. Electrical charge density is yeah. there's yeah. I've just been looking at the charge density of mitochondria. There was an article about it online and. It's as dense as lightning. Wow! In mitochondria, so just yeah. uh, curious about this. Yeah. Well, in in, in these synapses, these are uh, chemical. Uh, this is chemical communication, more so than electrical right. communication. But I don't know how the. Yeah, I don't know how that translates into charge densities and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I just. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see what they what they do in the methods here. Um, in so then they have these triple neur neuron circuits, which are where you have uh, three neurons that are sort of in a group, I guess. So they're kind of like a circuit where you have A, B, and then you have C. And so you can see like there's this relationship back and forth here. And in this case, you might have a relationship like this. A to B, B to C, and then C to A, or something like that. You might even have... C to B, a good measure if, if that's, but they're all different connections here. So then this is uh, in triple neuron circuits, the non-random synaptic organization may facilitate local functional roles, such as signal integration and coordinated activation of functionally related downstream neurons. So there's this, um, uh, there are these different types of, this is still non-random synaptic organization. This may facilitate local functional roles, different things going on. Um, and these clustered synaptic topologies emerge as a guiding principle in the network, presumably to facilitate distinct parable functions along single neurite, effectively increasing the computational capacity of the network. So, you know, instead of having these things randomly distributed uh, in the 
within all the different projections, they have these clusters of synapses. And so that actually coordinates things a lot more than would otherwise be the case. So that's that's what they're getting at. So let me see if they have, um, so they're really talking about the computational repertoire and like what kind of the nuances of the computation of this uh, of this connectome. Because as, you know, if we just consider a connectome and we consider the cells that are connected, we just use like a binary value. Actually, the way you get the connectome data, it's usually where you have A and B. And then there's some, uh, you know, like if you're looking at an electrical connection or a chemical connection, if electrical connection would be where the neurons actually have a sort of a, you know, what, something like that. Um, you can actually characterize that connection with a number between zero and one. So a lot of times they'll have a strength of a connection or sometimes it'll just be either a connection or no connection. So that's your that's how you usually characterize it in a in a data model. Um, but they want to actually go further and ask, you know, if we look at like some of these uh, synapses that cluster, because the synapses can be diverse, they can have different functions. They might pass certain uh, neurotransmitters over others depending on the synapse. Then that's you know that's where a lot of that computation is occurring all in one place. And so, you know, it's localized and it's maybe a little bit more, um, it may allow for a little bit more diversity in terms of the signaling. Uh, so, okay. So like, for example, Songbirds implement a reliably coincident detector based on nonlinear summation of multiple inputs to the dendritic tree. So you have all these different inputs coming along this tree. And the question, the neuron has to sum a lot of those things or they have to sort of summarize the signal. So you're getting all these different signals, you know, A and maybe C are also going into B and there are all these signals and they're coming into the cell and the cell has to know which ones are the ones it wants to act upon and then fire and then move, you know, move the information down to the next neuron. So that's why we care about like these different synapse clusters and this computational sort of um uh nuance and so that's so there you know you see things in songbirds you see things in the human brain there's a lot of work that's been done on neural coding and things like that and that's kind of what we're getting at it, but the c elegans example gives us a very good model for looking at that where we know all of the different connections in this network bradley has this model been used for uh uh, say deep learning uh people have done things in like uh they've done things like uh dendritic computation so dendritic computation is where you have a cell and instead of having these inputs with weights you have all these different signals coming in and then those signals are sort of captured and there's some rule to integrate them so it's like it's almost kind of like this model where you have multiple inputs and they're coming in and there's some rule to integrate them so they use them i mean they're more experimental but they've used them for different types of signal processing and other types of applications like that where that actually is pretty advantageous yeah so yeah that's and then uh so in the absence of distinct axons that output the integrated signal from the dendrites such computations may be performed in a locally compartmentalized manner. Um, and then in this case, local activity may, may be nonlinearly integrated in a compartmentalized manner and then transmitted to the postsynaptic neurites from within the compartment and without evoking current changes across the entire neuron. So this is where you have them all coming in one place. The signal gets integrated and then it doesn't, you know, there isn't any, uh, sort of variation across the neuron. Uh, if you had things coming in from different uh, from different dendrites coming into the neuron, into the cell body, um, you know, you might have like local differences across the cell in terms of all kinds of information. Because if you integrate it locally, then you have these, when they get, when it gets converted into some sort of electrical activity, 
uh, there can be or changes in current. So you have these changes in you have these neurotransmitters. They're invoking these changes in current, and then they're tr being translated into some sort of electrical activity in the neuron. So it's it's kind of an interesting relationship, and it kind of speaks to Susan's question about what's going on with local charge densities. And the answer may be that, you know, you have these uh, currents, you have this balance of different, uh, you know, um, uh, you have this sort of regulation of the current within neurons, and then that's relating to some sort of functional uh, electrical activity later. So this is a sort of a better drawing than what I did there on my board, where you have the inputs here on a dendritic tree. And this is like, you see this in dendritic computation as well as in a biological system. You have these inputs to this tree, which is basically the branches uh, that bring information or bring this information into the neuron. There's integration. It could be locally or it could be sort of in this trunk of this dendritic tree. Then it comes down to the cell. And then there's some, uh, you know, there's some activity in the cell that generates uh, an output, it generates a, maybe an action potential. C. elegans doesn't really have, and we'll talk about this in the next paper, it doesn't have true action potentials, but um, put that aside for now. And then there's an output to the next cell, which gives it information, it gives it neurotransmitters to transmit and things like that. And then cells can, of course, become entrained with one another throughout these networks that form. And this is, of course, the car compartmentalized computations they're talking about where you have these clusters of inputs and there's an output here where it may just go from this input to the next cell or it may go down to the cell body. So there, that's that's the benefit of these input clustered inputs. Um, so they, they do this, uh, they've actually compiled a database of synaptic coordinates, which is, uh, they're using connectome data provided by reference 15, which is this, um, they don't have the paper pile reference here, but um, they contain the skeleton maps of most neurons as well as the position of chemical and electrical synapses across along the neurites. So I think these are like microscopy images, but skeleton maps of those microscopy images. So they have this information that is available and there's like, uh, they have a coordinate system for it. Um, so here we focus on the connectome formed by chemical synapses and use the term synapse to refer to these chemical synapses. And so that's that's how they do that. Uh, let's see if we can find reference 15 here. Um, okay. Okay, 53. Oh, there you go. Yeah, reference list. Uh, 15 is Cook. So this is a paper that came out in 2019. This is actually uh, whole animal connectomes of both C. elegans sexes. So we know that there's a hermaphrodite, which is the default sex in C. elegans. It's where most of the work's been done on like, looking at uh, connectomes. But then in 2019, they also published a connectome for the male. And there are differences between the male and the hermaphrodite, largely with respect to like some of the, uh, the, the male as a sexual organ and it's, you know, it has some other behaviors that are uh, specific to the male. So having these double, I mean, we know the connectome of the hermaphrodite, and there's minimal difference between that and the male. But having those connectomes, you know, it just gives us a better better resolution on C. elegans. So that's where they got their data from here. Um, but there are other, like, if you don't, you know, there are other uh, data sets uh, if you want to look at the connectome, I know I talked to a lot about this. There are a host of other uh, data sets that have, and I put them in this in the Slack channel if you're interested in that further, or we can talk about it further if you're interested. Um, so this is a figure here where they they kind of talk about these three neuron circuits connected by clustered synapses that may support local functional roles. So in A, you have this. Um, Three possible layouts for a pair of neurons. So this is your three layer uh, or your three neuron uh, motif that they talk about. So like we said, you know, ABC can be connected 
in different ways. So C might go to A and B, A and B might converge upon C, and A, B, C might be uh, directed in a chain. And I think in my word, I came up with a little bit different arrangement, but, you know, they just, they consider these three. Um, and then they have this, where they have two neurons here, or at least I think the branching from these two neurons, and they match up with these synapses. So these are like, this is this uh, diagram is a little confusing, but so this is a common neurite C. So this is neuron C in this network. And these are the synapses that exist along this projection. And they're clustered like so. And you can see that like neuron A and neuron B also have their processes and they need to connect somehow to C. So there are actually these connections. You can see AC1, BC1, AC2, BC2. So you see that there are these common connections. So like A is connecting to C here, B is connecting to C here. Um, this is A and C, another connection. But you can see that they're making connections in these clusters on C. So A and B are connecting, projecting to the neurite of C. That those connections are are based on cluster, you know, they're projecting to clusters. And so then you can pair them in different ways. So it's a combinatoric system where you have different clusters here of synapses that are paired between two cells and their projections. And then you can actually calculate a mean distance between these uh, different pairings. So these two synapses, you can calculate a pair, a pairing, a mean distance between them. And you can, you know, kind of tell what cluster they're in and how far apart they are. And then you can actually shuffle these synaptic identities as well. So you can calculate a shuffled mean distance. So you can actually look at it like a randomized version of this to assume that maybe there isn't like clustering or functional clustering involved in this. And you can look at those two things uh, in, in comparison. Um, this is... Um, Number C is actually probably a map of, oh, okay, so uh, that's all A. It's a long uh, legend. An example for a tightly clustered set of synapses. So this is C. You have uh, three neurons, RIML, -R RMDL, RMDR. And these are all uh, neurons in C elegans. This is the nomenclature they use. And then this is just these colored lines are the connections between the two. So the red is R RIML to RMDL. So this is, um, these are two neurons on the left side of, this, of the worm where you have uh, RIM and RMD and they're both left on the left side and they have connections. Uh, RIML and RMDR. So this is a bilateral connection blue, and so you can see them here, and then other synapses shown in gray. So you can see these blue dots here that are clustered. You see the red dots are clustered, and you see the gray dots, which are up and down. It's very hard to see here, but they're up and down these projections, and they're not clustered. So you can see how those relationships sit with respect to real neurons. So uh, I think that's probably all I'll say about this paper. It's a nice paper if you want to read it further. They work this all out and they have a nice model. This is actually a nice image. Might as well get into this. Um, of some of the imaging data that they have. There we go. So this is compiling their database. This is um, this is a ring here of uh, nerves. They call a nerve ring. And this is some of the, how, what these look like. So these are uh, synapses. We have, uh, you know, different types of neurons in the nervous system of C. elegans. We have motor neurons, sensory neurons, and interneurons, which sit between the motor and sensory neurons. And they're all color coded here. So you can see these projections from the different neurons in this image. And you can see these black dots, which are the synapses. So you can see it's a very dense network of, of synapses and there's a lot of opportunities for interconnectivity. <clears throat> this is the nerve ring here, which is in the, uh, you'll see this in the, the C. elegans along the body axis. 
And this is, again, is the body, this is in context where it's this nerve ring. You have a lot of connections here along these different projections from different types of neurons. And so that's where this connectivity resides. And so this is also how you can get your data. You can get it from microscopy uh, data where the neuro, where the synapses are marked in the images. So this is uh, where they have them marked. You can identify them in the uh in the microscopy, this is one micron, so this is a pretty uh, high resolution image. Um, and they can actually, this is I think a close up of some area where they've been able to mark this. This is a synapse of RAPR and URADR. So this is where you can tell where those two connect. And then they've done a distance between neurite centroids. So they actually have a map of the distance between the centroids and they have so this just tells you that they have a coordinate system worked out where they've calculated these distances i talked about earlier and they show that most of the distances are pretty short um so these are fraction of synapses and the distance between the right centroids so that means how far are the synapses out from the centroid of the cell on these projections and they find that in general they're not very far out in terms of uh this this micron measurement so they're using uh the distance in microns and it's actually not even a micron uh, so there's this distance actually it's between the projections not between the, the cells but the centroids of each one so you can see here that there's a average distance so they, they're able to build a, a atlas from that those data so that's that's how they do that second paper i wanted to talk about is this paper on modeling of three types of non-spiking neurons in C. elegans. So I talked about how this is, uh, C. elegans doesn't really have traditional uh, uh, action potentials like you might see in a human neuron or some mammalian neuron or something like that. They have a different type of, uh, not, they have non different types of non-spiking neurons. And I'm not sure the reason for this, but um, this, this paper goes through some of the biology here. This is the International Journal of Neural Systems. This is back in 2005, but it's a nice review of these different types of non-spiking neurons. So um, the abstract is uh, reads, the nematode C. elegans is a well-known model organism in neuroscience. The relative simplicity of its nervous system uh, shares some essential fe features of the more sophisticated nervous systems uh, we need to fully characterize the nervous system. Uh, following a recently conducted electrophysiological survey on different C. elegans neurons, this paper aims at modeling three non-spiking neurons. And this, uh, these are RIM, a AIY, and AFD. And these are just like the nomenclature uh, for different types of neurons. Um, so yeah, the convention is to use three uppercase letters, and then the last letter is usually like the left or right side. So that's how they usually, these are adult neurons that have different, terminally differentiated. And uh, that's, that's how they do this. And, this, and these, these conventions are different than the developmental cells, which you'll see in a lineage tree where they have like their sublineage and then the, the letters like, you know, left, right, or dorsal ventral or something like that. They'll have like, they have a totally different convention for the adult cells. To date, they represent the three possible forms of non-spiking neuronal responses. So these are just three examples of these three different types of neurons. To achieve this objective, we propose a conductance-based neuron model adapted to the electrophysiological features of each neuron. These features are based on current biological research and a series of in silico experiments which use differential evolution to fit the model to experimental data. We formulate a series of hypotheses regarding currents involved in the neuron dynamics. These models reproduce experimental data with a high degree of accuracy while being biologically consistent. And so they kind of go through these examples. Um, and so this is these are the three here, three different types of neuron. Uh, actually, they have four here. They have RAM, transient outward rectifier, uh, AIY, outward rectifier, AFD, bistable, and then AWA, bistable spiking. 
So that, those are the four that they have in this. Um, so in vivo recordings of four different neurons, this is just uh, a recording of the bioelectric activity within the neuron. So you can see that there's, um, you know, this is electrical activity in millivolts, and you can see the, how that happens. And this is, um, so these are just characterized the four forms of possible neuronal response in the nematode. And so figure A shows the evolution of the membrane potential from a series of current injections, which is just a, a, a technique they use to sort of find the electrical activity or to elicit it and record. Um, figure B represents the evolution of total ion currents of different neurons when their membrane potentials are clamped at a fixed value. So this is where you have what they call patch clamping and they do the measurements. Um, C, figure C describes these relationships obtained from average volt clamp recordings. So you can see that there's this ramping up activity in some of these neurons in different, in different, uh, at different levels. So you have this differential response here at both the steady state and the peak. So, uh, this is a lot of, uh, neurophysiology that I'm, not really had a huge amount of background in, and I've I've become a little bit familiar with it, but not that familiar. So I don't want to uh, pretend to be an expert at this, um, but they they definitely have like uh, some interesting aside from sort of the interesting nuances of C. elegans uh, neurophysiology. Um, they're kind of you know just kind of interesting systems. We know this you know, cell by cell, we know what they kind of do, they know what their function is. So it's an interesting system to look at this and see what kinds of electrophysiological activity occur. So, um, so yeah, they talk about different um, ion channels that exist in some cells, but not others. So, you know, you have, for example, a calcium ion channel. Some papers show the existence of a calcium ion channel dynamics in AIY and AFD neurons, as well as RIM neurons. Additionally, calcium currents have been reported in some other neurons, such as AWA neurons, AWC neurons, ASER, AIB, AVA, and RIA. So there's like this uh, calcium ion channel that's been reported in some, uh, some cells and not others. The presence of an inwardly rectifying potassium current. So when I talked about those different classes, those different classes imply that they have different sets of ion channels that are active in these cells. And so in this case, there's an in inwardly rectifying potassium current, which is a potassium ion channel, has been experimentally confirmed in AWA neuron and HSN neuron. Uh, then there, this relates to genes that encode for these different channels being present in, or active in the cell. And so these different cells are, uh, you know, the product of, you know, gene expression of different types, and they produce these uh, ion channels, and they produce a differential uh, uh, neurophysiological signal. So, and then there's also a leakage current corresponding to chloride channels, uh, which plays an important role in the behavior of neurons. And then there's a lack of voltage-gated uh, uh, sodium channels in the C. elegans neurons as well. So there are these differences in C. elegans neurons, both amongst just C. elegans neurons and within C. elegans neurons. So, um, yeah, so that's, and then they do this differential evolution where they look at, um, they use a population-based metaheuristic. So this is an evolutionary algorithm approach, which is nice. Um, they, kind of work on that as a, as a way to do uh, optimization. So uh, this is what they call meta heuristic, which if you're computationally savvy, you know that is something that you might use as a way to kind of characterize uh, optim optimal behavior across a large set of things. And you can use in uh, evolutionary algorithms to use populations of, of these different things as a way to, or we evaluate the population based on a fit, uh, fitness function. So, um, so they try to, uh, they try to 
create solutions using differential evolution and find optimal um, values for this. So they actually have their code on GitHub, they have parameter estimation uh, for using differential evolution, and they're able to actually come up with some parameters uh, from the literature, and they have minimum maximum values for their simulation, and then they do the simulation. And uh, they're able to actually model some of these neurons, or some values for some of these neurons, uh, given things from the literature and things that they've been able to observe for these for these cells. So this is for RIM, AI, YN, AFD. Um, they present in that table. And they do, you know, some other statistical tests. They look at the evolution of a membrane potential. So I think the take-home message of this paper is that there's a diversity of cells within C. elegans connectome. They have different types of ion channels, and those ion channels are... Um, you know, result in different, maybe different behaviors that we can observe. So that's, that's all I'm going to talk about there. Um, yeah, so those are like, sort of, I wanted to go through some like kind of new results for C. elegans, but I also wanted to go through some of what we talk about when we talk about a connectome and why all those things are important. Um. I'm I'm still interested in the charge density and wondering if uh, some of this could be uh, modeled like a battery or something. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't, I don't know a lot about that. Yeah, I don't know a lot about like how people simulate neurophysiology, but I think they may do things like that. Yeah, they have to look more into it. But. Maybe I need to be attending the battery sessions <laughs> also, <laughs> just because. Just anyways, I've got to to get back to work on my tensegrity project very soon. I think I have it kind of figured out. I'm going to have to attach the cells to a ring, a solid ring, on the outside of them, so that the tensegrity is stable. I think that's the trick here. Any suggestions? <laughs> no, it's my project, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah, that, that, yeah. Yes, there are there are a bunch of papers on uh, the stability of consecutive structures. They're highly mathematical. Yeah, and uh, to have a singular tensegrity. Um, to be stable, it needs to have some sort of a twist to it, at least the, the type that models uh, sort of honeycomb structures. The top and the bottom ha are twisted from each other. So, so it's a chiral structure. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I could show you. I, yeah. <laughs> I have to put that twist on it, or it is not stable at all. Oh. And if you put the twist into it, then it's stable in most cases, not all cases. Okay. <laughs> but like our cells are not, they don't have a twisted bottom, like they're, they're lined up, like you can see images of them. So they're not like that. So they're stabilized by each other because they're part of a tissue. If they're not part of a tissue, they round up and and undergo apoptosis or something, or yeah. or something else, or crawl yes. away, or I don't simple, know. Simple tensegrity structures don't take into account the volume assigned to the nodes. The volume assigned to the what? To the nodes. To the nodes. Yeah. So, There's a volume assigned to the nodes? Okay. Yeah, well, a cell. Suppose, it, suppose each node is a cell. Then it has oh. a volume. And if it's touching other cells, it can't compress any further. So it can't. So the volume itself could be a source of stability. Oh, well, yeah. I, I'm hoping that I can get a multiple cellular thing and then put a ring around the outside of the whole thing and yeah, say... Yeah. See, it's attached to a bone or something. And then, well, no, let's take, let's take a simple example. Consider a tensegrity structure consisting of two points connected by an elastic element. The elastic element will compress. 
and bring the two points together. But if the two points represent cells, they stop. Yeah, because they have volume. Yes, because they have volume. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. And that's, I'm just, um, my, um, I'm just considering single cells and then making a grouping of them. It's kind of, okay. kind of okay. starting with the single one and then I've yeah. already got this drawn out, but it's unstable. It throws, the, I, it says, eigenvectors are, what was it? It's eigenvectors are bad. <laughs> or negative or something. <laughs> and point, show me the, show me the math then, you stupid program. But I still haven't figured out how to find the, the matrices that go with the computations. And I asked the people from Comsol for that. For that, and I don't know how do you see the matrices that are behind these graphics? And they laughed at me. <laughs> what you know? Oh, I'm a PhD student. I have to see the dumb matrices. I can't just use your program. <laughs> so I, I don't know. <laughs> the whole thing is like, uh. but anyway, I have to start back into it. <laughs> like this week, I promised. <laughs> I, I can, papers I've seen on stability of time. Oh, you you froze, but yes, there's stability. Um, I have some. It's, um, you make a tensegrity structure, and if it co collapses to a pancake, it's unstable. <laughs> it smells like to be pancakes. <laughs> Where okay. the, a nice one st stands itself up, self self supporting. Yeah. Well, they, cells are not self supporting. They're yeah. they have to be in their tissue or something. Yeah. Or on a surface they like. Yes. Anyways, <laughs> I have to start this. Anyway, thank you for the introduction to the to the week. Where I have yeah, to yeah. Go back to work. This is, this is really interesting. I, I think um, some of the charges involved in the body, if they really are, if the mitochondria really do have very high charge density, I think they're going to bend light. Yeah. Oh, could you send me a paper on that? Yeah. yeah. Please. Yeah. Well, I, a charge density bends light. And the charge density of mitochondria. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll I'll try to find that because I need to because okay. it's a part of it's a part of what I'm doing. So. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. Uh, one of the conferences I was at, they were talking about mitochondria, and they said that actually mitochondria aren't like the little beans that we see in the textbooks. They're actually networks, and they were focusing on the network aspect of mitochondria. So oh. they're also yeah. they're what. If you and look what? at a 3D image, mitochondria are not like these little beans that you see in the textbooks. They're actually networks. So the the major oh. part of it is that they connect to each other and, and they connect oh, throughout okay. the cytoplasm. So it's really interesting. You know, they maybe oh. serve as sort of like sort of like a neural network in a lot of ways, or like something oh, like a connector. Okay. Do you have um do you have that? Uh, yeah, I'll have to look into that again. I have to go back to that reference, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, I saw also was at a conference one time, and they said that a lot of the action, a lot of the chemical action, occurs on the curves. Right. Yeah. It brings things closer together and stresses stresses the, the membrane, so it provides energy for some of the chemical reactions. Yeah. So that, that's also an interesting thing. I'm, I'm interested because I'm looking into the uh, origin of chemiosmosis, oh, okay. which seems to be just speculation right now. I'm trying to see if anyone's got any sense of speculation. Yeah. And what is chemiosmosis? Well, that's the um, gradient of protons across the membrane. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. So there are two aspects. What they, they have one protein that creates the gradient and another one that uses it and makes ATP. That's, okay. the, that's the modern version. And the speculations are about how this gets started. <laughs> okay, well, I'm 
interested in the modern version. <laughs> so the high density would be very interesting. Yeah, so it is a high density of charge. You know, yeah, that. maybe lightning did start the bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, have a good day. Yeah, have a good day. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.